Welcome to Kiffin's Keep, an intellectual resource for the pillar and buttress of the truth, which is the church. This is the project of the London Lyceum, or a project at the London Lyceum, that is dedicated to serious thinking for a serious church. I'm Jordan Stefaniak, host of Kiffin's Keep and president of the London Lyceum, and I am pumped to be here this evening that I'm recording this. I've recorded this four or five times now. It's almost 2 a.m. and I'm pretty exhausted, but I'm still excited because I think this is going to be a fun episode talking about bad reasons to no longer be a Baptist. Before I do that, reminder, if you haven't watched the show before or if you have and you have not subscribed yet to the London Lyceum channel, do that for me. Even if you're listening on the podcast, go click on your YouTube app and click subscribe. You're going to get all the great London Lyceum content. We've got all sorts of our traditional roundtables, fun stuff that's coming from LL there. You're going to get Kiff and Skeep. Also going to get generally particular, I think, awesome content being created. Lots of time and effort. So I highly recommend you putting in the little subscribe button and hit the like button as well. And then drop a comment below. As always, you're welcome to disagree or agree on comments. Don't care. I like comments. It's fun. I enjoy a good hearty disagreement or a hearty uh, trolling comment. That's fine too. Now, for the topic at hand, bad reasons to no longer be a Baptist. So as I mentioned, I've recorded this before in the last hour and a half. And uh, for whatever reason, the stuff didn't come through. So let's talk about it again. Uh, It'll be the first time for you, the sixth time for me. So hopefully I'm better this time around. So what I'm talking about here are what I consider reasons that often happen for especially young men who've been raised Baptist, and then they get exposed to other theological ideas and principles, and they say, you know what, I'm no longer going to be a Baptist I'm because of reason X, Y, Z. And they don't make the reason for a good reason. I think there are good reasons to no longer be a Baptist. If you have scriptural theological reasons to say, I reject credo-baptism for these reasons, cool. The Lord be with you, bless you, that's fine. No problems here. So I'm not saying you have to be a Baptist uh, to be very clear, I know I have lots of people who watch this who aren't Baptist. That's fine. Love you. That's cool. What I'm trying to talk about here is a common problem that I see that happens among Baptists. And I say, you don't have to not be a Baptist. You can still be robustly Baptist and get all of these things that you want. And we can be all on the same team. So one of those common ones is covenant theology. I think this is probably the most common one that I see personally. Um, I don't know if it's the most common one you guys see. People have never been exposed to covenant theology. They get exposed to covenant theology at some point, and they think, oh, I have to become a pedo baptist whether that's of the Presbyterian variety, the Anglican variety, or something else. They say, that's what I got to do. I've never realized this stuff existed, and since Baptists aren't covenant theologians, then I'm out. There's two reasons this is foolish. Number one, you can have all the covenant theology you want in a be a Baptist, go, it's becoming a resurgence, all the 1689 sort of federalism stuff, go check it out. You can still get covenant theology. Now, if you're still uneasy with that and you say, no, 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 I don't like their formula either. I will like the one substance, the one covenant of grace and the two administrations. I would say, cool, you can still be a Baptist. Uh, I've written on this before and a link to it in the description on uh, what was the title of this paper? It's with Journal of Biblical and Theological Studies, I think Reforming Credo Baptism. I tried to lay out a case where you can say, yes, you can have the same exact traditional reform f- formula when it comes to covenant theology and still be a Baptist, because I'm going to deny some of the necessary inferences that are made from one administration of the covenant to another administration of the covenant, because this is fundamentally a positive law, which is baptism and not a natural or moral law. Not going to get into all that, just going to say, I think fundamentally getting excited about covenant theology doesn't mean you have to no longer be a Baptist. And thinking that one covenant of grace, two administrations is the right way and the right framework to read the Bible also doesn't mean you don't have to be a Baptist anymore. You can still be a Baptist. I've had a number of conversations about this over however many years now, and Oftentimes I explain this to people and they say, yeah, well, I want to be no longer be a Baptist anyway. And I'm like, okay, well, then you're making a decision for bad reasons. And, and you know what, that's fine. We all make decisions for all sorts of reasons. And oftentimes they're, they're bad, but the Lord still guides us and uses us. And that's fine. Idea here is if you're wondering, can I be a Baptist and have this sort of reform for format of covenant theology? I say, yes, 
Now, I wrote that paper a long time ago. And part of the cool thing about writing essays and getting them published is you get people who are smart to read them and tell you where you're wrong. People have said that I'm wrong in a bunch of stuff on that. I don't know. I haven't really thought about it, to be honest with you. And I'm probably not going to think about it for a while because that's just not my cup of tea anymore. I'm interested in reading other stuff. But I just wanted to put that out there in case I get the, the Covenant Theology Baptist trolls on here. I hear you. I see you. I just don't care that much. Sorry. <laughs> Maybe I will at some point in the future. I probably should. But, you know, I've got my time in other stuff. Another reason that I think is bad to no longer be a Baptist is liturgy. So a common refrain that I see is people grow up in this low church environment and they get exposed to, maybe they go to a college in a large town and there's a big church downtown and it's a giant, wonderful, beautiful Anglican church or a beautiful Presbyterian church or something. They walk in and there's just this robust, reverent style of worship and they say, ah, this is what I need. This is what I want. And I would say, well, I guess I wouldn't say anything yet. Uh, that's cool. Yes, absolutely. And then they say, I can't be a Baptist anymore. I've got to be an Anglican because of look at all the bells and whistles and how it draws me to worship and all of the, the emphasis on the aesthetics and, and, and everything that goes into worship. Uh, that's part of your senses. I think that's good. I don't think that's the right uh, ultimate decision there because you can still be a Baptist and have high forms of liturgy and have a s sort of style style liturgical style of worship where you have set confession set pardon you know these like formats uh, of liturgy and you can have a cappella and all those beautiful things and be a baptist you can have high liturgy there's nothing incompatible here between baptist identity baptist principles and high liturgical formats of worship now, I, I get you, some of you guys are the hardcore Baptists out here. Your Baptist meters are going off and say, no, 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 that's that's not Baptist. Well, I said, no, it, it can be Baptist. That's not a necessary principle, not a necessary condition for being a Baptist is to have a low church form of liturgy. Maybe you like that more. Maybe that's more common. Maybe it's a common condition. Maybe that's more agreeable and ethos to the Baptist faith or something. But that's not necessary. So just to be clear, Jake and Garrett, if you're watching this, you can be a Baptist and still appreciate and, and prize high forms of liturgy, such as me, though I am not in really a super high liturgy. It's pretty low, but it's not super low. Anyway, my goal is not here to convince you one way or another on different things. It's just to say you can still be a Baptist and like these things and want these things and agree with these things. Another example would be just high-powered theology. This is another bad reason people stop being Baptist. They grow up in an anemic church culture. It's sort of Baptist-ish, uh, evangelical Baptist-ish, whatever. And then they get exposed to high-powered theology, and they realize, why is it that no Baptists are doing high-powered theology and thinking? All of the serious thinking is happening at the Presbyterian church down the street. The pastors there, the elders there take things very seriously. They actually think theologically, and my Baptist church just thinks pragmatically. I'm going to go be a Presbyterian. I understand the impulse here. But again, that isn't incompatible with being a Baptist. You just maybe you're at the ba wrong Baptist church, or maybe you need to help encourage serious thinking in your own context, in your own Baptist church. It's part of what was the impetus for starting the London Lyceum to begin with, was looking around and saying, we don't have enough serious thinkers in our own Baptist tradition. Let's encourage that. Now, we're broader than just Baptist tradition. Obviously, we're broadly Protestant reformed, but even you know people outside of that, we still want to encourage them to think just Christianly. The main idea here is what I'm saying, and what I'm saying is you can still be a Baptist and think theologically and think robustly. You don't. Ha it's not as if you have to be a pragmatist to be a Baptist. That's that's foolish. That's that's just Americanized culture, unfortunate aspect of where our Baptist uh, Baptists are at. Hopefully, we can turn that around over time. And part of what we're doing here is encouraging that. Another thing. A bad reason to not be a Baptist. I'm going to step on some toes and make people mad that are hardcore Baptists or whatever. Cool. I like doing that, I guess. Maybe. I don't know. I don't. But I'm going to do it anyway. It's going to be fun. So a lot of people, oftentimes I hear, will say, I can't be a Baptist because I want to have a connectional polity. See, people on the internet say this. You, you can't be reformed without a connectional polity. Therefore, Baptists aren't reformed. 
Number one, that's a dumb argument. Number two, you can be connectional and be a Baptist. Here's why. The form of connectional polity that you see in current Americanized versions of things like Presbyterianism with the, the session and the synod or whatever, the Presbytery, I guess, not the synod, is pretty much almost apples for apples with what a traditional form of Baptist associationalism would have looked like, where you have regional churches bonding together to share each other's burdens, to, to share insights, to, to help vet pastoral candidates. I think pretty much 90% of what Presbyterians do in America in their current form of government is what Baptists used to do and should recover. You should recover this more connectional polity. So you can still be a Baptist and have a connectional polity. I think a lot of American Presbyterians don't realize this, and they think that's just their calling card. That's another reason that I'm a Baptist, because look at the Bible in Acts 15 and these different things. And I could say, yeah, I agree. You can be a Baptist and have that same polity functionally. Now, there's some quirks about American Presbyterian stuff that I think Baptists should reject, like pastors not being members of their own local churches. That's weird. I wouldn't do that, but I think there's probably a lot of Presbyterians who also think, yeah, that's weird. It's just, it is what it is. The main idea here, again, you can still have a connectional polity and be a Baptist. You don't have to reject it. You can have this sort of structure. And to be honest, there's a lot of Baptists who functionally adopted even Episcopal forms of government. Like I've talked about multi-site churches in the past. I mean, that's an Episcopal form of government. They've adopted that functionally. I don't love that. But that just shows that Baptists are willing to take that on. Okay, two more things, and then I'm going to wrap up. One is, I think, particularly related to the sacraments and the nature of baptism. This was a big one for me, to be honest with you. So when I was considering becoming a Presbyterian at one point, however many years ago it was now, a big calling card for that was just the way you understand the meaning of baptism. So I think in a lot of Baptist churches, what happens is baptism has become super subjectivized and super individualized to where it's like my pledge of allegiance uh, to God, and it's it's about me and my decision, and I'm going to celebrate my decision. I'm going to get a t-shirt that says my decision. I said this. I did this. And I'm going to remember that as my moment. And I came to realize that I don't like that as a meaning of baptism. I think the primary meaning of baptism is the promise of God to save me, the promise of God to bring salvation through judgment, through the waters. And that's what I wanted to emphasize in baptism. And I started to realize, I looked around, I was like, wow, all of these Baptist churches, they don't seem to emphasize the same thing that I want to emphasize, the objective promise of God in uh, this sacrament. But then I realized you can be a Baptist and affirm those exact same things about baptism. You can prioritize the objective promise of God in baptism and say that is the fundamental meaning and still be a Baptist. And conversely, it's you can be a Pado baptist and also affirm the subjective, this is in some sense also a reflection of me and my repentance and my faith. And that's true, yes, but the priority is still on the objective sign. So again, I think you can be a Baptist, you should be a Baptist. I think Baptists would be good to recover a more traditional reformed understanding of baptism where the meaning and the fundamental meat of that is the promise of God. There's a great book by Brandon Jones on the waters of promise. And I, I really appreciate him bringing back that fundamental focus on the promise of God in the waters. Now, one last reason, I think this is the sixth reason for to not be a Baptist Oh, before I get to the sixth reason, I want to mention a pragmatic reason that I see oftentimes. I think it fits in one of these buckets, so I'll call it one of them and not a seventh, is uh, common. When I was thinking about becoming a Presbyterian, I talked to former Baptists who are now Presbyterians. One of the common reasons they gave was, well, I realized my Baptist church said they were going to practice regenerate church membership and church discipline in these ways, and they didn't. Therefore, I became a Presbyterian, and I thought. That's a really bad reason. Even when I was almost convinced, I thought this is a bad reason. This is totally pragmatic and and really silly and kind of kind of 
kind of weak. If, if I'm honest, it seems like you just wanted to become a Presbyterian. You didn't have a really theological rationale or justification. Uh, and I get it. Pragmatic stuff. It makes sense, whatever it, it plays in to decisions that people make, but I just don't think that's all that persuasive. Okay. Now, the last piece is, I think, Catholicity, and this could go a little bit with that high-powered theology comment, because I think the idea is people, uh, they grow up Baptist, they aren't exposed to the wealth of the Christian tradition. They have this sort of trail of bread mentality, and sorry, Jake, this idea where Baptists are the true line and everybody else is corrupt and bad, but then you get exposed to Anselm and Augustine and Aquinas and Scotus and, and Bonaventure and, and Turretin and Calvin and Bavink. And you read them and you're like, these are my homeboys. These are my heroes. These are the people that I look up to that have trained me, that have taught me to read the scriptures, have taught me to understand things. And you think if they're all in alignment on this, why wouldn't I want to be? Why wouldn't I follow them? Why wouldn't I follow my fathers and my grandfathers in the faith if they all agree on this? And am I fundamentally rupturing the Catholicity of the church by rejecting other people's baptisms as valid when I'm a Baptist? Saying that pe no one was baptized except pagan converts for 1,500 years or whatever that is, a 1,000 years. Go watch one of Gavin Ortland's videos on the history of baptism. You'll realize it's murkier than people like to make it out to be. I'm not going to get into all that. He did a great job there. But I think I understand the impulse here with this Catholicity bent, with this desire to inhabit the Christian tradition and to say, look at all these guys. I don't want to reject my errors and I don't want to fundamentally invalidate all these baptisms. I could say, though, you can be a Baptist and affirm and inhabit the one holy Catholic apostolic, one holy Catholic apostolic, apostolic Catholic, wow, I'm confusing myself now, church, um, and still be a Baptist. You don't have to, number one, deny all those baptisms. You could, and, and I, there are arguments to be made that you can remain Catholic. I think they're problematic. Luke Stamps has done some stuff in Journal of Biblical Theological Studies to say you can be Catholic and reject those as valid baptisms. I think that's problematic. I think you can still say that's an that's a valid baptism, though it's irregular. Gavin Ortland again has done some good work here. But even so, let's let's say either way you go here, I still think you can be Catholic. I still think you can look at all these great resources and say, yes, they are my fathers, they are my heroes in the faith still. And I can still be robustly Baptist. And there's also the reality that our tradition now. Other traditions look to the Baptists to say, this is part of my tradition too, as a Christian. We are all together pulling together in this one holy Catholic apostolic church. I think I got it right that time. So I think fundamentally a desire for Catholicity is a bad reason to not be a Baptist because there are ways you can prioritize Catholicity as a Baptist to not be a separatist. I think if you read Matt Bingham's Orthodox Radicals book, you'll see these two sort of varying Baptist streams, one that's more separatist and one that's more, uh, I don't know what the word is, it's more just Catholic in the lowercase sense. There's a more ecumenical spirit among them. That would be where I fit. There's other guys with the Linden Lyceum that's more separatist in nature, and that's cool. Like I get, There's breadth and, and, and texture in the Baptist tradition. You can have different viewpoints and ideas. I think the fundamental point I'm trying to make, though, is that no matter where you're at, you can emphasize Catholicity and value all the resources that God has given to us in the church, whether they're Baptist or not. So I think these are some reasons that are bad to no longer be a Baptist. Now, maybe you've been listening and or watching and you're not a Baptist, and I, I, I applaud you for listening this long. Maybe this encourages you to stay whatever you are, an Anglican, a Presbyterian, fill in the blank, uh, because you've got your own laundry list of bad reasons. People are no longer Presbyterians and now they're Baptists or Methodists or whatever it is. Maybe though you're a Baptist and you've been waffling and maybe this encourages you to say, you know what? I can be a Baptist. I can be robustly Baptist uh, because these things are not incompatible with what it means to be a Baptist. 
or maybe you're watching this and you've seen other people stop being a Baptist because of some of these reasons, or maybe there's more reasons. Maybe you would say you missed reasons seven, eight, and nine. Love to hear those in the comments. I'd be curious to see what the most common ones are for you. Maybe I hit on some of them. Maybe I didn't inflect them right. I don't know. Let me know what you think. Yes, agree. No, don't agree. Maybe I missed something. Maybe you think one of my reasons to not, bad reasons to not be a Baptist is, is actually a good reason to not be a Baptist. And you'd say, no, no, no. You can't have high liturgical forms of worship and be a Baptist. Convince me in the comments. I'd love to hear it. As always, if you have thoughts or ideas in general related to Kiffin's Keep, if you have topics you'd like me to touch on in the future, let me know. I appreciate you guys for watching this. This is fun and encouraging and challenging for me. I hope it's the same for you. And as always, thanks for thinking with me.